go for it! Hey everybody, it's me, your buddy Dave, the host here at the Dark Stuff channel here on YouTube. Uh, thanks a lot for checking out the new video. Uh, these are the new glasses. Apologies, they're giving off a weird glare, but hey, at least I can see that and I'm not just wondering what the hell's out there, you know, like this. Anyways, reference to my last video where I couldn't really see what I was doing. Anyways, um, so today's video, I'm just going to start a sort of a new series. I don't, I don't know if I should really call it a series, but it's been something I've been thinking about doing for a while, and that is to just pick out the best debut albums of all time. Rock and roll, rock the rock era, okay? Um, and just talk about those particular debut records. Not a commentary on the band, like it could be a band with a great debut that had a shit career after that, or a band who, you know, whatever. But the point is, the debut album is what I'm gonna talk about, okay? And I'm gonna start the first one off with this one here. Spring Session M from Missing Persons. Okay, came out in 1982. And this was a monster, monster record. Uh, I grew up in Nebraska, I'm still there right now. And in the early 80s, and so in 82, 83, that period, um, I heard Missing Persons on the radio in Nebraska. They used to play the crap out of this record, especially walking in LA. Um, which was huge on the radio here. Words was huge on the radio here. So, the band is often characterized as like a new wave band. And uh, I guess because of the time period it was, they weren't just traditional rock and roll, though they did have a lot of the traditional elements. They had the guitars, the bass, the keyboards, um, and then a, a good song and a great singer and all of that. Lot of what I consider to be incorrect criticism of punk and new wave was that the guys and women couldn't really play you know that that's where you go if you don't have any musical skills and it's okay you can kind of learn on the job but there are tons of exceptions and I don't even think that's really should be considered a rule but the missing persons people were definite exceptions um, all of them or not all of them but all of them but one had worked with Frank Zappa prior either on his records or they uh, like around that Joe's Garage era in the late 70s, either on record or as a touring member. So let's see here, uh, vocalist Terry ba uh, Dale Bazio, she was played with Frank. Terry Bazio, her husband, drummer, also played with Frank. Warren Cucurillo played on uh, uh, Frank Records. Uh, Patrick O'Hearn, who played the bass, he also uh, was a touring member with Frank Zappa. And then Chuck Wilde, who played keyboards, started off as a session guy with them and then ended up becoming a, a full-fledged member at the time. Their singer, Dale Bazio, was just so striking, okay, and so visual. This new medium of MTV was coming along. Of course, they put her front and center on the cover, okay? She's this beautiful um, woman, scantily clad, with multicolored hair and she'd be wearing these like clear plastic bras when she's doing shows and and you know I think I saw Missing Persons for the first time on something like Solid Gold you know because in 82 there wasn't a whole lot of music TV and I hadn't gotten MTV till the next year so I know I saw them somewhere and I, I it was probably something like Solid Gold you know and there's only three channels music is not on TV all that much back then of course uh, being a teenage boy, I was just like, whoa, look at that Dale Bazio. And while, like, some people would consider Dale to be some sort of distraction or, oh, that's the gimmick or whatever. No, because she's involved with the songwriting on every track along with Warren Cucurillo and Terry Bazio. Um, and it's her unique vocal style that really makes the songs stand out beyond just the great songs and the the musicianship and the great production we 
Her completely unique vocal delivery made the tracks. Okay, just made them. Um, very rarely do debut albums come off almost like a greatest hits, but like honestly, Windows, Destination Unknown, Walking in LA, Words, all of those, and maybe even uh, It Ain't None of Your Business or Win yeah, Windows, I think I already said. Anyways, on a, uh, you know, the Missing Persons Greatest Hits, all of those songs are on there. And this is almost a Greatest Hits album unto itself. It's that good. I mean, even the songs that nobody knows, you know, like Rock and Roll Suspension, No Way Out, Tears, you know, the, well, Tears was actually, a, maybe might have been a single. Um, it's just something that I've been listening to now for almost 40 years, and I was listening to it again recently before, when I was deciding to do this uh, video, and it was like, it was remarkable how much I still connected to the music and still felt, you know, like it still felt relevant and it still felt good and I still enjoyed listening to it, even though I've heard words in Walking in L.A., a million times. I mean, they've probably been on something like Guitar Hero or something, who knows at this point. Um, the only thing they had before that was this. It was an EP, self-titled EP. And apparently it's, back in the day, it sold like, you know, a quarter million copies, you know, which set them up nicely for coming out with Spring Session M, which ended up being a gold record. And to me, I'm surprised that's not a, a platinum record. I mean, usually... New Wave and, you know, really sort of almost fringy sort of bands didn't make it to Omaha and didn't, like, weren't played on the radio because we had a pretty conservative uh, rock station. You know, they were so busy getting every Journey record on that it was sometimes hard to squeeze in something a little different. But I know I heard Missing Persons on the radio back then. Uh, the band had two more albums before they broke up in 1986, and both of those records had their moments, had a couple of good songs. But... They went in a different direction production-wise. They were a lot more synthetic sounding, a lot more electronic sounding. And um, Dale's voice still sounded great. And uh, again, there were good songs on both of the albums, but it just didn't seem as immediate as this one, as Spring Session M. Because Spring Session M still had acoustic sounding drums. Um, it still had like harder guitar. And uh, it, so it was some, some of the more traditional rock elements mixed in with all their edgy, sort of new wavy sort of uh, sounds. And um, as they went along, their sound got more and more 80s and more and more whatever, which was very current and very hip at the moment and probably was very appealing to them at the time, but makes it sound much, much more dated. So when you hear like Color in Your Life or whatever, or some of those other songs on that record, on those records, it's like, yeah, it's good, but it's just, it never hit as, as well as Spring Session M. Just a fucking fantastic record. Um, after their breakup in 86, Dale uh, signed with Prince's label, did a record for that label. She's done some other stuff. Uh, Terry Bazio has done a lot of session work, played with a lot of other bands, toured, and, uh, and session work. Warren Cucurillo was in Duran Duran for about 15 years uh, through... You know, starting in, as soon as Missing Persons broke up, he was there for the next 15 years. So all, a long period of time, they had some pretty big records during that time. It wasn't their heyday, but, you know. And the only reason he's not there anymore is because they got back together with the original lineup, the Fab Five or whatever, with Andy Taylor. And so they didn't need Warren Cucurillo anymore. So that's unfortunate for him. The bass player, uh, Patrick Hearn, he went on to make... Uh, was, he the, was he the bass player? Wait. Patrick... Patrick O'Hearn, sorry, he was, he played keyboards and bass, and he went on to have a pretty successful career in um, what ambient music, or they used to call it New Age, um, and, and he did that. And the rest of the guy, the other guy, I'm not really sure, uh, he was a session keyboard player or whatever, and he probably continued on doing session work after that. They've tried reunions, never have the original all five been together again since the breakup, but... They had the core of the group, Dale Bazio, Terry Bazio, and Warren Cucurillo got together, um, and it didn't last very long. It was only, um, I think, two, three shows, and they did record some songs. I haven't even heard them. I don't really care. I don't want it to damage my impression of the band. Um, but Dale Bazio has toured around the country plenty of times with her own sort of version of the band. Warren Cucurillo used to play with them, and now it's just Dale Bazio, Missing Persons featuring Dale Bazio. I saw a version of Missing Persons 
one of those ones when it was Dale and a bunch of everybody else. In the mid to late 90s, when a band I was traveling with uh, had a spot in Des Moines, Iowa, opening for Missing Persons. And um, it was bizarre. I don't remember a lot of it. I had, we had a six-hour drive to get there and then load in and all of this. And uh, um, I don't remember meeting Dale at all. I, I, we watched the sound check, and her voice still sounded you know, pretty much like it did before. Uh, the band was just a bunch of who knows and they weren't that impressive necessarily um the crowd l liked it a lot they you know they heard these songs on the radio so for them it was a big deal and what was funny the only thing i really remember about the show was the band i was traveling with they had a cd out and uh, a vinyl record and um at the time and they, you know they probably sold like 500 copies or a thousand copies of their stuff at that point they were very very unknown they just got randomly booked on this show, but the crowd, who I don't think saw a lot of concerts in their day, um, was excited about them and like went up and asked them for autographs and stuff, and which was like blew their minds away because it was like, what? You guys want our autograph? Okay, okay. You know, it's obviously they felt like, okay, we're you're opening for this band that we hear on the radio, so you must be pretty good too. Anyways, it was cool. I mean, to have people that sort of. You know, fresh and and kind of naive. I don't even know what they thought of the band after the afterwards, but uh, either way, that's that's neither here nor there. So this was my discussion. This is a fantastic album. If you haven't heard it yet, I think you should just own it. Try to find it on vinyl, but it's on Spotify if you just want to give it a spin. But it is fucking excellent. Um, solid debut. Thanks a lot for watching, everyone. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye bye.